Merker's Law of Software Updates says, if you're running software, it's out of date. Please welcome Cloud Native Foundation Governing Board Member and VP of Business Development of JFrog, Kit Merker. Hello. I want you to all imagine the software that was built and crafted by developers, was run through CI and CD, was tested, is ready to be deployed, all ready to go, and it's just sitting there, uninstalled. On smartphones, on servers, on serverless computing, on IoT devices, just sitting there, but not installed yet. You know, we heard about liquid software over the last couple of days, and it's this idea that software is gonna flow from the hands of developers to customers, and it's gonna be seamless and beautiful, and it's just gonna work. But where we are right now, all of us, I kind of think it's about to hit us in the face. And like this guy, it's like right here, this is where we are. Liquid software hasn't quite uh, come, to, to come to us. And we wanna make it real, and we wanna make it easy, but, but is it? Now before I go on, I wanna say a couple things before I get started, because I noticed that Kieran is hiring uh, for Uber. Where's Tali, our VP of sales? She signed up to be a driver at some point, so you should probably uh, submit your resume. <laughs> but what I really want to talk to you about today is explosions. Huh? I want to thank all of our sponsors for allowing us to get sound effects. Thank you for your money. Uh, so I want to talk about four different explosions that are happening right now in the software world in DevOps, okay? So there's these things called binaries. I'm just trying to learn about this. It's ones and zeros, right? And it turns out, I was shocked to learn this, the order of the ones and zeros actually matters. So um, I know, it's like surprising. And then you think about, well, we don't write ones and zeros. We type it out in our own languages, and then we compile them, and then that turns into different orders of ones and zeros. This is shocking, it's really amazing. And if you're writing in C++, it's different than if you're writing in Java, if you're writing in uh, other languages, Go, you end up with different uh, orders of binaries. And there's an explosion in the number of languages that we can use, and in fact, some of the things that are happening with uh, containerization and serverless and all these things are letting us actually use more languages that, that work in these different uh, environments. And if it was just, you know, write your code, compile it, set your build flags, make sure your little ending is correct, that would be easy. But there's actually a huge number of package managers and binary formats. In fact, so many I had to create this GIF to uh, show you the whole Wikipedia page of all the package managers and binary repositories. Just watch it scroll, it's not, isn't that nice? Um, so you might not use all of these, but what we're seeing with our customers, especially complex organizations, is a lot of different technologies being used together. Now, how many people here, I think maybe this question already got asked, but how many people here are using exactly one technology? Uh, let the record show that everyone raised their hands. And I got, uh, you know, we all just got back from KubeCon, and um, one of the things that they showed at KubeCon, I got this slide from Dan Cohn, who's the exec director at uh, CNCF. 0.1% of the code um, that we're right, that we think of as our application, is, you know, it's our code. The rest of it's all coming from other places. It's coming from open source and libraries and the cluster and everything else. Now, you might think of this as the tip of the iceberg, but it's actually more like the tip of the ice cube that's floating in the martini glass held by a polar bear sitting on the iceberg. No? Okay. The art department uh, would not make me an image of that. Photo not found. But the trend continues. As we build more complex and more, uh, more complex software with more dependencies, and we do it faster and faster, we actually see that the amount of binaries relative to the amount of software you're building is actually you know, increasing. And we've seen this trend, but we're not at the end. We look at moving to serverless, you're taking more and more dependency on other people's binaries, and it goes on to IoT and even low code, which, by the way, I love this low code thing. Um, low code means low code relative to the 0.1% that, that we already have, where people are really reconstructing applications. 
And then you can think about AI when you have to deal with training models that you want to take from TensorFlow, trained in the cloud, you want to put on a mobile device or put it into an IoT device. All of these things are going to mean relying on other people's binaries. And it's getting more and more complex, and it's, um, it's continuing to explode. Now, when you're working with your own source, it's one thing, and you're sharing in source because you can compile everything. And I hope you guys all, you know, if you, if you do compile from source for everything, I commend you for that. Uh, it feels to me like a little bit of a waste of uh, compute resources. I know they're, they're cheap, but it's still uh, time and energy. But when you're dealing with other people's binaries, you start to have questions like, where the heck did all these bits come from? And which ones can I trust? Which ones are the right version? Compatible, secure, performant, certified, signed? All of these questions that you have. And on top of that, it's not just the questions of today, of your new binaries, it's also the questions for what have I already deployed when a new vulnerability is detected or a new exploit is found, a new class of exploits found. In fact, the only way to, to really solve this problem is to know where the binaries are located in your, in your uh, production environment, to know where it's already been uh, vulnerable for you. And you can't predict it in advance. What we're seeing is an explosion of data, and the metadata about binaries is the key to answering these questions about other people's binaries. You can applaud if you'd like. That would be great. Yeah, this could, okay. One guy agrees. Um, <clears throat> The, what we're seeing in data outside of our domain, when you think about predicting what movie you want to watch or predicting or automating a complex industrial process, these same techniques can be used in software. It turns out, now that we have these automated CI pipelines and artifacts stored and tests automated, this byproduct of sharing and building and testing and running and getting customer feedback actually can be used to inform our decisions about software and make it run better. Another explosion we're seeing is the cloud native landscape. Now, I'm going to go through each one of these one by one, so I, I don't worry. Um, we'll get into the details. Uh, but we look at the landscape in cloud native computing, and it's, it's amazing. It's astounding to me. We are seeing so many libraries and frameworks that are reusable that are driving uh, new ways to do computing. But all of these projects are, helpfully for you, releasing new versions all the time. So you need to think about a system for how you're going to bring these pieces together if you're going to run cloud-native applications. And this is only one piece of the ecosystem. These are just the ones that are kind of recognized. This isn't the one that's going to be launched tomorrow by an open-source developer sitting in a coffee shop somewhere. This isn't the ones that are the legacy systems or your existing frameworks, your, I guess, would it be cloud immigrant technology? Um, emigrant? Immigrant? One of those. So of all the cloud, just think about the cloud. So our new life goal is to make sure we know everything that's going into the cloud. We know the metadata about those binaries and those systems that we're building, the software we're building in the cloud. But the cloud is only half the battle. Because the other place that software is running is in devices. Now, today. I'm not talking about the future. I'm not a visionary. I'm just talking about right now. There are three devices for every human on the planet today. And this trend is predicted to continue, that we'll see more and more of these devices. And all of them are out of date. All of them are running software that needs to be updated, that isn't installed. And to update these devices, you actually have to have the confidence to bring your binary and have the right answers to those questions at the right time. So, so what do we do? So this, this whole idea of keeping these pieces together and working, uh, luckily for me, I don't have any answers. Um, it's frightening, though, in a way. It's actually frightening. But to help us uh, solve this problem, I want to call someone to the stage. Uh, Dror Berzinski, our VP of product, he's going he's, uh, he's gonna to fix it for us. Here you go. Here you go. Good luck. Thank you. Hey, everyone. So I would like to talk about four challenges that uh, organizations are facing today. So the first one is uh, creating a globally distributed uh, DevOps toolchain. And then I want to talk about uh, trusting your software. 
and software distribution at a global scale, which is different from the first one, although it sounds the same. And finally, about measuring and analyzing your uh, DevOps lifecycle. So the first challenge is a globally distributed uh, DevOps tool, tool chain, and this is quite a common scenario for organizations. So it can be that you have um, globally distributed teams, multiple development sites, and it can be that uh, your CI environment is in, on another site or in the cloud, or simply because you need a DR environment for, for your uh, CI. And um, in order to do this, you need the binaries flowing between all those environments, all those sites. And this is something we've been doing in JFrog for quite some time. We're using Artifactory and Replication, and I guess that a lot of you are already doing it today. But there is one challenge and another thing we realized that you need to do in order to, to make this work. And this uh, is about who can access those binaries. So it can be humans, it can be machines, but eventually you want to make sure that you have the same permissions, you have the same users, the same access tokens, all across those sites. And today, in order to do it um, with Artifactory, you need to do some kind of calling REST APIs or some scripting, and we wanted to improve this. So about a year ago, we launched uh, JFrog Access. This is a service that comes with Artifactory. If you are using Artifactory 5 or newer, you already have it and using it. And JFrog Access is about managing everything related to authentication and authorization for Artifactory. So it's uh, your users, it's your groups, it's the permissions, and it's the access tokens. Now, in the last couple of months, we've been working on connecting all of the JFrog products to Access. And this will uh, basically allow you, first of all, to have one set of users and groups and permissions uh, for all the tools. You will not have to replicate or create multiple users all across the tools. And this will also enable you to do SSO between the JFrog tools. So if you log into Artifactory, you will not need to log in again to X-Ray. And I guess this, this is quite nice, but it's not really solving the problem that uh, I started with. And in order to do it, uh, I would like to introduce a new access functionality called Access Federation. And Access Federation is all about synchronizing uh, your users, your groups, your tokens, your permissions between different sites. So this is something I know a lot of you have been asking for, and now we are delivering. And Access Federation will allow you to connect uh, two or more multiple uh, uh, access servers, can be in multiple sites, and synchronize um, everything related to security between them. So it can be unidirectional synchronization or it can be bidirectional synchronization. Uh, so let's think about it. I have a development site in, in the US, US West. I create a new access token. Immediately I can use the same token in my other development center in the East Coast. And this will allow you to create those uh, kind of topologies, for example, a full mesh topology. So today you can do it with Artifactory and Replication. And now you can complete the picture by using uh, Access Federation and have um, all your credentials uh, synchronized as well. OK, so the second challenge is about trusting your software. Now I, I plan to have this kind of introduction, but then all of you heard John Willis yesterday talking about security and those kids with hoodies and no pants. No, so I don't really need this introduction. You understand why you need to trust your software. But trusting your software is not just about uh, security vulnerabilities. It's also about making sure that you are not using open source licenses that might endanger your company or, or your customers, in fact. And it's also about making sure that when you uh, distribute or deploy your software, this is exactly what you wanted to deploy. It's the exact version. Nobody changed the bytes on the way. And this is not such an easy problem in today's world because, uh, for example, applications have changed from monoliths into those microservices that are on Docker images. And each one of those Docker images is, it has its own operating system with some packages on it. And then the applications, and you saw that every, every other day there is a new package type that's coming in. So, so the slides from Kit. So you need to be able to identify vulnerabilities with all those package types. And it's, uh, it's becoming a complex problem. And two years on this stage, we announced uh, J4 X-Ray. 
And JFOG Extra is exactly meant to allow you to trust your software and to trust your software all across the DevOps lifecycle. So if we start from the uh, code phase, then uh, we have an IDE plugin that allows the developers to connect to X-Ray, and when the, once they are adding new uh, dependencies to their projects, they can see whether they are vulnerable, if there are any known vulnerabilities, and what is the open source license they are using. So it's a good way to stop vulnerabilities in, at an early stage of the process. Um, and, and this is actually the, the, the best time because the cost is the lowest. And afterwards, while you're building at the build phase of uh, your life cycle, um, we have uh, plugins for CI servers, for multiple CI servers, or you can do it without CLI. And this allows you to scan your build or all the artifacts you're producing and all the third parties you're using during your, at build time, and then make decision if something is found to be vulnerable. You might want to break the build, you want, want to take other actions. Um, but it's not only when you are developing and creating the software, it's also about protecting the software after it was released. So let's say you uh, released a new version, you deployed it to the cloud or it, uh, at your customers, and then a new vulnerability uh, was found. How do you know that uh, this vulnerability is not affecting you? So X-Ray contains a component graph that basically represents all the artifacts you have in your software and the connections between them. And every time there's a new vulnerability, we are checking the graph to see how it impacts and might impact the software you're running. So we're also protecting you after you uh, deployed or distributed your software. So you understand this is a critical piece of the life cycle of the tool chain. And you don't want this, uh, you know, don't want X-ray to be down or offline for some reason because it will affect um, your, your uh, release life cycle. And this is the reason why, um, just recently, we launched a high, highly available version of X-Ray. So this will allow you to continue uh, using it X-Ray and making sure that it's always up and pot protecting uh, your life cycle uh, and allowing you to trust your software. Now, global software dis distribution. So any type of software needs to run on some, some kind of computing device. It can be a server somewhere in, the, in, a public data, in a public cloud. It can be a device. It can be um, in, a, in a retail store, in a point of sale. Um, so all of them need to run somewhere. And this means that you also need to take the software to, to the place where it's running, right? You need to distribute it so we can deploy it. Um, and this might sound like a trivial issue because you just need to copy bytes. But it's not that simple, because if you need to update one server, that's OK. But what happens when you need to update multiple uh, clouds? And multiple, using multiple cloud providers um, in different regions of the world, and then suffering from networks with high latency or low bandwidth? And then what happens when you need to update hundreds of retail stores, right? This is even more complicated. And think about all those devices the kids spoke about. What happens when you need to update millions, millions of devices? Okay, so this is a, a bit of a challenging problem. And so just to discuss a few use cases. So the first one is when you are uh, developing um, SaaS-based software, cloud-based software, and you want to uh, deploy the software in multiple clouds, can be public clouds, private clouds, or hybrid need to take the software in order to provision it to the cloud. And then retail stores. I meant, mentioned retail stores. So those stores today are, are running hundreds, uh, hundred different types of software, and anything from managing inventory to queues to your support line and, and stuff that's running on, on the point of sale, uh, of sale itself. And you need to take the software to all of these stores and update it, and, and it's, it's a challenging thing. And then devices, so devices are running software and you want to update the software and you want to fix bugs and update it as, uh, as soon as possible. And this is even at a larger scale. So we've been working hard on this uh, challenge for the past, uh, well, past year. And now I'm happy to announce a new JFOG product called JFOG Distribution. Yeah. Um,
Thank you. And JFOG distribution is exactly about allowing you to distribute software to wherever you need it. So it's going to be based on a new concept called release bundles. Release bundles are basically a bill of materials for your uh, release. It means that it contains a list of artifacts, all the artifacts that you want to distribute. It can be for multiple builds, it can cover multiple microservices or one application, it's up to you. And it's kind of similar to build info for those who are using it today. It's a similar concept, um, but op I mean, meant for the uh, releases. And once you create a release bundle, um, it's immutable. So you know what you want to distribute, you lock it down, and then nobody can change it. So nobody can mess with your releases. And JFOG distribution is built on top of Artifactory. So Artifactory al already knows how to deal with your artifacts. And basically, distribution is coordinating. It's orchestrating all the distribution of the artifacts between the different Artifactory servers. And for this, we are also introducing a new version of Artifactory called Artifactory Edge Node. So the Edge Node are meant to be uh, deployed as close as possible to your runtime environment. So it can be in your retail store, it can be in the, uh, in the public cloud, or it can be a gateway to your IoT devices. And the Edge Nodes are optimized to deal with uh, distributing software. So they take care of immutability, they take care of security, and they know release bundles as a first-class citizen. Now, what we have also done is uh, created a new optimized replication algorithm. So this algorithm is meant to improve um, software distribution. And it's making sure that only the bytes that you need to get to the other side, to the runtime, are being replicated, and everything else you, you don't need to replicate. And so this is in Artifactory, and it's used by distribution. And finally, um, we made sure that uh, your distribution process is secure. So we're doing it by taking care of immutability. Once you create a release bundle, nobody can change it. And we are taking care of it by signing everything. So your release bundle content is signed. And it's another measure to, to make sure that nobody is changing uh, the release bundle. So how it works. Uh, the first step is creating the release bundle. You can do it using the REST API, or you can do it uh, manually. It's up to you, we have a UI for it. And basically, it means that you have to select the artifacts that you want to distribute. So we are using AQL behind the scene in order to query for the artifacts. It's not just the artifacts, it's also the metadata that accompanies them. So if there are any properties, they are part of the release bundle. And then, uh, Distribution creates this uh, uh, entity of a release bundle and it's ready for distribution. The next step is distributing. So you have to choose to which edge nodes you want to distribute. It can be all the edge nodes, it can be in uh, one region, uh, depends on your deployment strategy. And for that, distribution is working with mission control in order to always get the latest uh, um, set of edge nodes you have deployed. And then um, distribution is starting a transaction. So it's starting a transaction that causes all the edge nodes and it's an atomic transaction. So we want to make sure that um, distribution is atom an atomic uh, action. So if you didn't manage to distribute all of the edge nodes, you don't want your automation to kick in and update only some of them. And finally, when the distribution is done, we close the trans transaction and then the new version of the release bundle and the artifacts are available on the edge nodes, and you can continue on to deploying the software or whatever you need to do with it. Okay, uh, so the last challenge I want to discuss is measuring and improving your DevOps lifecycle. Now, in the past few days, we heard a lot about uh, shortening the release lifecycle, about liquid software, how you want to shorten the time between when somebody has an idea about a new feature until it's in production. And if you want to improve, first of all, you need to know where are the issues, where are the bottlenecks. And for that, you need to measure because you have no other way of knowing what's, what's going on. And then when you, you improve, you want to see that you actually improved. So you also need to measure and compare it to the previous results and see whether what you've changed is actually improving. And you also want to be able to show management the ROI on everything you're doing. So you're investing in tools, in processes, in people. You want to be able to show that it actually matters and you've proved. 
And this is also kind of a challenging thing because in Keith's presentation, you saw this DevOps landscape with a zillion different tools that all the companies are using. And the information about your build lifecycle or your uh, DevOps lifecycle is scattered around all those tools. So it's a challenge of collecting and correlating all of this data. And uh, we are actually in a unique position to help you with that because Artifactory is kind of connected to all of those pieces in your DevOps lifecycle. Now, about a year ago, we acquired a company called CloudBunch. Uh, they're dealing, they had the products for DevOps analytics. And today I'm happy to announce that uh, we are launching uh, a new version of Mission Control that includes a new functionality based on the CloudMunch tool uh, called JFOG Insight. Yeah. And JFOG Insight is a single place for insights about your release lifecycle. What it does, it connects, it con collects matrix from different tools. It can be the JFOG tool stack with Artifactory and X-Ray. And other tools you are using, so your version control, the Git, uh, your issue tracker, your CI server. And basically, we are correlating all the information from all those tools in order to provide you um, a dashboard for your DevOps lifecycle. Um, so Insight will work with a new concept uh, called project. And a project will be basically a collection of builds. So you'll select the builds that you want to have as part of the project. It can represent a product, it can represent a microservice or any other unit that you have. And um, then Insight will make sure that it analyzes the build, understands what's the CI server behind it, what is the branch in the version control and so on, what are the repositories that are being used, and provide you with a predefined dashboard with different types of uh, matrix. So as an example, this is an example from Insight. This is a matrix that's showing you the average uh, build duration. You can see that you can compare uh, if your project is made out of multiple builds, then you'll see, you can see a comparison between them and you can see the trends over time in your build duration. Um, another matrix that we are going to show is the average vulnerabilities count. This is, this is coming from X-Ray. And this allows you to see if you are improving, if your uh, developers are solving those vulnerabilities or they are just keep on stacking up. Now, uh, later on, we have a session by Ranjit, the Insight uh, product manager, is, and he's going to show the product in depth and also have a live demo. So I encourage you to join the session. So I guess that by now you've seen all those goodies and you're probably asking yourselves, okay, how do I get it, right? You know, or not? How, how, how do you get it? That's, that's a good question. So I'm thrilled to announce the new JFOG platform. <laughs> it's already, if you go to our website, you can already start a trial. It's out there. It's live. And JFOG Enterprise Plus is a new DevOps platform that basically allows you to manage your DevOps lifecycle from code until you get to a successful deployment or to update your software. And what we have inside is everything that I spoke about and, and even more. So it starts the flow with Artifactory in your CI environment, taking care of the build artifacts. And then with X-Ray, protecting your software and making you trust your software across the, the lifecycle. And once it's ready for production, we have distribution and the edge nodes to take it all the way to the runtime. Now underneath uh, all of this, we have the JFOG access. This will provide authentication and authorization services and SSO for all the products. And looking from above, we have mission control that's going to uh, help you manage this entire life cycle and also to measure it and to see how you're improving. Now, I've been talking too much about it, so, um, in the past uh, uh, couple of months, we had a beta program with some of our selected uh, customers that were evaluating Enterprise Plus. And you are going to hear about it uh, pretty soon. But what I decided to do is, and, and during the Enterprise, uh, the, this beta, we actually used Enterprise Plus itself with all the services in order to um, 
deploy or publish new versions of Enterprise Plus to our beta customers. And what I would like to do now is to have a live demo of the environment. It's, it's, it's a clone of the environment that uh, we were using during the beta. So video guy, it's the time to move to the demo. Okay, so uh, I will actually start with uh, mission control. Just wonders of live demos. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Sorry for the glitch. So this is my environment. I have multiple sites. I have a development site in Europe. You can see this one is my uh, development site in Europe. This one contains all the versions uh, that I'm going to deploy. And then I have a couple of edge nodes. So I have uh, uh, edge nodes on GCP and on AWS in the US. I also have one hiding here in Australia somewhere. And what I'm going to do in this demo, I'm going to create and release bundles for all of our products, and I'm going to distribute them to all of the edge nodes. But the first thing I would like to do is, um, once the software is distributed, I want to download it. And for this, I want to have an access token. This access token will allow you to authenticate and download the software. And I would like to use the Access Federation for that. So I'll go to the Access Federation configuration page. And here I can uh, configure the relationships between my access servers. So what I would like to do is create a new star topology. I can also have a mesh, but in this case I need a star. And here I select the source access. So this is the source. Whenever I'll, I'll create some new stuff in it, it will be synchronized to all the others. So I'm taking uh, my environment in Europe. And then I will use the edge nodes as my targets. So when I create the um, access token in Europe, it will be synchronized to the edge nodes. So, and then I have to choose what I want to sync. So in this case, I will choose to sync everything, the users, the groups, the permissions, because I also have a permission target that I need to replicate. And let's click Finish. OK, so now I have Access Federation configured, and I just need to create my access token. So I will use the Artifactory REST API. I have this uh, postman here. And I'm going to create an access token. And this is for a user called Robot. It's my robot account. Um, and it has permissions to download. So, OK, I have this access token. I will get, to it, get back to it shortly. Now let's look at the release bundles. So, I'll switch to JFOG distribution. OK, so you see that SSO is working. I don't need to re-log in. Now, in this screen, I can see all the release bundles that I already have there. So you can see I've been playing with this demo. And there is a release bundle for Artifactory, another one for X-Ray, one for Mission Control, and one for Distribution. And let's look at the Artifactory release bundle. So on the left side, you see all the versions of this release bundle. Every time I create a new version, it's basically a new set of artifacts. And then you can see the files that are part of this uh, release bundle. So they are grouped by types. So this is, for example, all the Docker image with all the layers. And if I look here, I'll see that I have the Debian, the RPM, and the zip distributions of Artifactory. And for each one of them, I can see information about the, the file, the checksum, the size, uh, all the properties that I have, and so on. I um, also have, uh, I can have release notes. I didn't invest in that much. And, and I can also see the release bundle uh, original JSON st structure. Now, I will switch to my Jenkins. And here I have a pipeline that basically knows how to create the release bundles. So every step of the pipeline knows to create a release bundle for a different type of product. And I'm going to run it now and create a new distribution. So I have to choose the versions. This is built so I, I can choose the versions of the product. So those are the versions that we actually have in Enterprise Plus. So it's Artifactory 6. 
Vision Control 3, Distribution Version 1, and X-Ray, uh, it's 2.1. Now, I'm only going to create the bundles. I'm not going to distribute them yet. Okay, so the pipeline is running. It will take a couple of seconds. It needs to run the AQL queries to collect the artifacts and to create a new version. Okay, so I'm done. Um, and let's go back to distribution. Okay, so you can see that the latest version have changed. It's 179, same as my build. And if I look inside, you can see that I actually have Artifactory 6. Now, the next step, I'm going only to distribute Artifactory for the sake of the demo. So I'm going to do it from the UI. It's also possible to do it from the rest. And I'm going to choose distribute version. And now I have to choose uh, all the target edge nodes for the distribution and basically run distribute. I can track the progress of the distribution. Uh, you can see that it's moving OK. Completed in US East, completed in uh, Google in US. OK, I completed the distribution. So now uh, the release bundle and the artifacts are actually on my edge nodes. So let's take a look at one of the edge nodes. Okay, here I need to log in because it's connected to a different access service. And not this one. Okay, this is the artifactory UI. You can see that you can also view the release bundles that are on the edge node from the Artifactory UI. So basically, I have everything here. Let's look at Artifactory. It's exactly what I was expecting. So everything is ready. And now um, you need to do whatever you want to do to provision the software. In this case, I created this uh, small Python script that's um, running a REST API query on, uh, on the edge nodes, looking for the latest version of the release bundle. In the release bundle, it looks up the path for the RPM installer and downloads the file, and then verifies the checksum just to see that everything is good. And for that, I need my access token. Okay. I need to copy the access token, provide it to the script. And let's see. So now the script have found that the latest version is uh, 179. It found the RPM, performed and used the CLI, JFOG CLI, in order to authenticate and download the files. And finally, verify the checksum. And now I have Artifact already to be installed. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much. That was my demo. And now Kit should come back on stage. <laughs> Okay. Give it up for he did it live. Come on, come on. Good job. All right. All right. So we've been working on this product for a long time, and we're very, obviously very excited about it. Um, but we didn't just do it alone, and this is something that we've been actually working with some people, um, some people who are here, uh, to actually test it and to see if it will work for them, get feedback, uh, but. To tell you more about it, I want to invite Lorelai Katapan, Senior Director of Product Management, to the stage and tell us about the beta. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Good luck. Hello, everyone. How are you all doing? Almost the end of the keynote. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you today to talk about the beta for Enterprise Plus. So just a bit, I'm sorry, let me get the clicker. Thank you. So just a bit about the beta itself. There were two main goals for the beta. One is to have a very solid release of Enterprise Plus, and the second one, but as equally important, is to be able to achieve customer happiness. And how did we do that? We decided to partner with some of our existing Enterprise customers, and for them to be able to evaluate Enterprise Plus on their own. We wanted to allow them to be able to look at the product, understand it, and be able to see and assess for themselves whether it addresses some of their major pain points and challenges in their DevOps within their organization. And we wanted to cover each 
of the major features and functionality of Enterprise Plus, which Dora has just presented to you all and also demoed. Was that a kick-ass demo or what? <laughs> so it was very important for us to be able to get the product early on into our customers' hands and to be able to assess it based on their own use cases. We gave them Enterprise Plus. We allowed them to install it, deploy it, set it up in their own environment, whether it's on the cloud or on their own local on-prem environment. And this allowed us to be able to um, identify some real problems based on some real use cases. Now, in terms of the framework itself, the beta lasted for six weeks, but initially, it was tremendously a cross-functional effort. It touched every single team at JFrog, from product and R&D, from support and solutions, our CTO office, DevOps, sales and marketing, IS and legal, and even our HR and operations who helped us create the t-shirts. It wouldn't be a JFrog initiative if we didn't have a t-shirt, right? Um, and in terms of the team that supported our customers, we had a dedicated team for each of our beta customers to answer some of the questions, um, help them with the issues that they may have run into along their beta journey. We also held weekly sync ups with our beta customers to gather more feedback from them. In fact, I was looking at my our, um, an analytics and we actually had 59 sessions total across the six weeks period. So now you're probably wondering who were our beta customers? We had eight amazing beta customers. And here they are. <laughs> so um, Tamar from our marketing team was saying, you guys look like you're about to take off into space. Yeah. <laughs> Um, actually, our beta customers, if you didn't see the fine print in your EULA, you signed up to go to Mars with me after this talk. <laughs> um, so you've probably seen them walking around yesterday and today with their awesome cool jackets, um, the binaries on the sleeves. And by the way, Kit, the ones and zeros, it does matter. The order does matter. In fact, these binaries spell beta. If you don't believe me, you can look it up. So our beta customers, there were eight of them, I said. There's Capital One, there's a Apple, <laughs> Adobe, Align Tech, Fidelity, Oath, also known as Yahoo, Ericsson, and Citibank. <laughs> so we wanted to touch different verticals within the industry from retail to financial institutions. And since, as you've heard the list of, with the list of customers, definitely no pressure at all to not mess up in this beta. <laughs> so at this point in time, if I may please ask our beta customers who are actually here sitting with you today at Swamp Up to please stand up so that your peers can recognize you. Thank you. So the results of the beta was very, very helpful and very valuable. Um, we had tens of issues identified and resolved throughout the beta. In fact, because of their feedback, we incorporated a UI and mission control um, to be able to have a much easier setup of access federation. Also based on their feedback, because of that, we prioritized the UI in JFrog distribution to be able to manage and create release bundles. So I cannot emphasize enough how appreciative we are to be able to partner with our beta customers along this journey. And very, very helpful, tremendously helpful in giving us their precious time, effort, and focus in giving us their honest feedback on the product. And not just the product itself, but also the life cycle of the product. Installations, setup, documentation, even our Kubernetes Helm charts to deploy the entire Enterprise Plus. 
In fact, actually this morning, we just pushed out a tech preview release of our Helm charts to deploy the entire JFrog platform. Thanks to our CTO office and our solutions team who worked really hard to get this out right, just right on time. So because our customers tested, we're all able to leap forward ahead. Okay, so now without further ado, I would like to invite three of our beta customers to join me on stage and to express an, their experience on Enterprise Plus from the beta. I will start off with our first guest, Artem from Align Tech. Thank you, Artem. So Artem manages the DevOps and tooling team at Align Tech. He's actually responsible globally for making sure that all of the infrastructure and software and their software development lifecycle is, is working really well. Um, in his spare time, he likes to take long road trips with his motorcycle. In fact, from his last motorcycle adventure, he traveled 11 countries in Europe from Italy to Norway. So, our second guest is Wayne Chatelain from Capital One. Wayne. So, Wayne, um, similar to our team, manages um, their DevOps and tooling at Capital One, and they're responsible for managing and providing services of Artifactory and the ecosystem around the products. Um, in his spare time, Wayne is, a neighbor, is an advocate of his neighborhood community. In fact, he's won two awards from his hometown in Fort Worth, Texas, and has been recognized by the mayor for his commitment to volunteering in his neighborhood community. And last but not least, our third guest, Tim Mulligan from Fidelity. Tim is the director and product owner of Artifact Management and Scanning. And their team hosts and supports Artifactory along with, and X-Ray along with the ecosystem of the products. Um, they provide services to thousands of users across the business, business units at Fidelity. And in his spare time, Tim likes to travel abroad. He likes photography. He likes to take pottery classes. He actually lives in Boston, South End, uh, my old stomping ground. And he lives in the Victorian row houses that were built in the mid-1800s. So without further ado, I'd like to ask some questions to our three panelists. How are you guys doing? Good. Good, good. good. Okay, so we'll start off with you, Tim. So Tim, you've been able to get your hands wet with Enterprise Plus. Your team has been able to assess the product. Uh, can you tell us uh, your experience on the product itself? Sure, um, I just wanted to first uh, thank JFrog. Um, you said the word partnership, um, and that's exactly what we view our relationship as a partnership. So we were very pleased to be approached and asked if we wanted to participate in the beta test program, and we jumped at the opportunity. Um, so, you know, as Fidelity uh, uh, embraces the cloud, as we look to adopt uh, multiple cloud providers, we're starting with AWS, but we have every intention uh, to use GCP and Azure as well. Um, you know, we're facing. Uh, challenges um, around scale, around storage, and um, also, you know, we want to uh, be selective what we uh, replicate or what we push out to our, our, our nodes in the cloud. Um, wow. So it sounds like security, res resiliency, reliability is a very important aspect Absolutely. in your cloud migration, yeah. You know, Artifactory has become a critical component in our CI and CD uh, uh, 
uh, process, our, our tool chain, um, everyone just expects it to be available 24-7, 365. Um, so it's, uh, it's a linchpin, really. And um, you know the, the notion of just replicating all of our crown jewels out to every uh, node in every cloud provider uh, you know, didn't sit well with us in the beginning. Um, so we were uh, using the term filtered nodes as we talked about extending Artifactory into, you know, our cloud providers. And we were uh, discussing different ways we might go about doing that. You know, we were considering custom development of plugins. We were uh, w questioning whether we should establish separate instances in each uh, provider and devise some mechanism to replicate, you know, just what we wanted to each uh, instance. And, you know, we shared those uh, thoughts, those uh, concerns, those needs with JFrog during our roadmap discussions, during our, our um, opportunities where we, you know, talked about uh, the future. So. Nice. Um, so now that you've assessed the product, how does this change the way you do things with your cloud migration within your organization at, at Fidelity? Well, first of all, we uh, like what we see with the distribution um, feature and uh, edge nodes. It, 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 it establishes patterns that make sense to us that we can um, embrace and automate and uh, enable within our, um, within our tool chain and within our pipelines. So um, it, it also uh, allows us to move beyond consideration of developing a, a bespoke custom solution because that has you know, cost maintenance, um, and it, it now gives us, you know, an opportunity, a roadmap to move forward with JFrog on a platform that addresses our needs as we um, adopt the cloud. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll... <laughs> so, Artem, um, similar question. You've been able to assess Access Federation, distribution, insight. Can you give us some of your experience on the JFrog platform? Yeah, so for those who don't know Align or Align Technology, we're a company behind Invisalign, so we move tools with code. Uh, that's what we do. Uh, and uh, we operate internationally. We have R&D centers uh, in multiple geographical locations. and. Uh, uh, Two features of Enterprise Plus that you mentioned were particularly interested for us uh, because uh, our developers travel, uh, they're using VPN to connect to uh, different uh, locations, and we want them to be able to use the same access uh, tokens, the same setup of their development environment uh, with any artifact nodes that we have in our portfolio. So, Access Federation, that's exactly the feature that is addressing that need, and uh, we were happy to test it out. But uh, the biggest challenge for us is uh, uh, distribution of our binaries to our infrastructure across the globe. So we operate in, not only in an uh, uh, environment that is familiar for everyone, like uh, public clouds. Uh, we also have uh, presence on-prem and presence on-prem in uh, uh, countries where internet is not that stable, like China and where a great firewall is uh, a real thing and can block pretty much everything uh, at given, any given moment of time, uh, which happened uh, last year, just three days before release, when a CDN network that we were using for, to deliver binaries got blocked, and we had to implement an emergency workaround for that. So distribution uh, sounded like a tool that we can use to implement uh, on-prem CDN that can address our need to deliver software to our infrastructure in a reliable way. So it sounds like with distribution as a solution for you, it's about overcoming physics, overcoming high latency, low bandwidth to be able to distribute your software across different uh, areas in the globe. 
Actually, one more thing about AlignTech, um, if, if you didn't catch that. Did you know that AlignTech is the one that creates the Invisalign for your teeth? <laughs> Pretty... We already asked for it. <laughs> <laughs> so if we get... If Meet we give next you, week. <laughs> if we give you trial license, you'll give us uh, some discount <laughs> on... My dentist said I need braces. Yeah, but it will, uh, you know, be it's, uh, like trial treatment, so not oh. fully baked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, similar question to you, how does Enterprise Plus become a game changer within your organization and how does it help you succeed um, in your role? I already explained our use case with uh, Access Federation. Uh, we tested it out. It, it works. It works like we expect it to work. So, th this need is basically addressed. And uh, distribution is uh, a bit more interesting case. So during the beta pilot, we actually set up uh, infrastructure on our uh, production clusters, including China and other remote locations uh, where we operate. And we managed to test distribution in like uh, real life scenarios and uh, get our packages, which is mostly Docker images, delivered uh, fast and reliable way to our remote locations. So uh, beauty of the solution here is that we already operate an artifactory cluster and edge node in distribution is just a, a tool that will be augmenting infrastructures that we already uh, know and like and uh, uh, will allow us to build on-prem CDN that uh, can help us with software delivery moving forward. Thank you, Wayne. Our, sorry, our temp, Wayne. <laughs> So Wayne, you've been able also to look into Enterprise Plus. Your team has uh, spent some, uh, quite a bit of time on it. Can you also share your experience on the JFrog platform? Sure. I mean, that beta program was a really great program. And like you said earlier, uh, really felt like a great partnership. Um, we were able to get you know, some deep dive sessions with uh, the JFrog support teams. And they really helped us get the products up and running the way that we wanted to. Um, you know, there's a lot of great features in E+, and uh, we really wanted to see how those are going to operate in our environments at full scale. So I know you have multiple artifactory instances across the globe. What is the biggest challenge or one of the biggest challenge that your organization is facing? Sure. So our biggest challenge is really keeping our data in sync across all of our environments. Um, you know, we utilize the, uh, the capabilities in Artifactory for users and permissions and groups, and we really need to make sure that all of that is synced and available across all of our clusters. Um, we, uh, we really need to make sure that, um, you know, the access federation piece of it helps us achieve some of these things uh, by keeping all of our environments totally in sync and um, you know, available. So we also have uh, resiliency built into our environments that we, uh, you know, if, if a, one of our clusters is, is experiencing some kind of problem, our user traffic will automatically fail over to another cluster. And we really need that user information to be available across all of our environments. So it sounds like Access Federation is a, is a great fit um, in your use case. How does that change the way you manage your artifactory instances? Yep, so today we're achieving that synchronization with some custom scripts that we've developed that utilize the existing artifactory APIs to pull data from one instance and push it out to our other clusters. Um, now, when we tested Access, it pretty much took that away and did that for us. Um, we were able to set up everything through mission control just the way that we wanted to. And it allows us to remove all the operational overhead with managing our, our customized scripts that we've created. And this really is going to allow us to meet all of our resiliency requirements right out of the box. Thank you, Wayne. Well, this concludes our panel. And again, I really appreciate our partnership. Thank you. I think we can go back. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. So we saw a great demo. We heard from our customers. This is exciting. Now, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, that's right. Explosions! I have to go to the next slide, though. 
Can you go to the next slide? I don't have the clicker. Oh, there it is. Thank you. These things get lost. Explosion! Uh, but actually, before I get to explosions, I want to remind you about the Liquid Software book. And there was such a long line yesterday. I know you probably heard this, but you'll be able to go get it signed today. Everyone will be able to. Don't forget before you leave. OK. So one of the explosions that we're seeing, well, I want to give you a few more updates on what we've been working on. Obviously, Enterprise Plus and some of the other announcements that, uh, that Drawer made are really important, but there's also some, uh, some other things we, we want to talk about. I want to just share a few more ideas with you before we go on to lunch and the rest of your day and the rest of the weekend. So first of all, one of the things we've been working on with this explosion of package managers is uh, new package types in Artifactory. And we know this is very important for you as you're adding more technologies to your stack and new things are coming out. So the first one uh, I wanted to re remind you of is Helm, which is the package manager for Kubernetes, which we launched uh, earlier this year. That's available in Artifactory today. So you can take your Kubernetes application, take the containers, describe the, uh, excuse me, your containerized application to run in Kubernetes. You can package that into a Helm chart and you can store that in Artifactory and deploy it into your Kubernetes cluster. And that's there now. Also, uh, two weeks ago at KubeCon, we announced support for Go. And uh, there's no Go programmers here, right? Any Go programmers? Gophers? Oh, there's a few. That's good. Now, I know we changed, they changed the logo, but uh, we like the Gophers, so I, I stuck with it. Um, the, uh, the Go programming language is getting really popular. It's the language that we've used internally for some of our products. It's used by Kubernetes, by Docker, uh, many other uh, uh, projects. And there's been, uh, we've been actually working with the Go community on this problem of dependency management for the last year. Um, but when we saw that Google was getting behind version Go or Vigo, we decided to support that as our um, package manager of choice for, for Artifactory. So that's available for you now. Uh, in Artifactory, I think it's 5.11 um, or later. Now, um, how many .NET C Sharp programmers are there out there? Let the record show that everyone raised their hand. Uh, we have today updated Artifactory NuGet support for NuGet 3. And uh, this is, uh, you know, obviously NuGet is a great package manager. We've had it in Artifactory for a long time. Um, but now we've, uh, we've updated it to the latest version of NuGet. So we're excited about that. Okay, so that's all available as of today. Um, I'm going to share with you a little bit about a couple of things that are coming in the future and hopefully you'll get excited about it. Now, how many data scientists are in the room? Everyone, amazing. But you all work with data scientists, I'm sure. So we've, we're going to be adding, in the coming months, we're going to be adding support for R. And R is a statistical programming language. I'm sure that your data scientists will love it. We know it's super popular in the financial services and fintech industry. I know that some of you are from that industry. Um, so you'll be able to store your packages and bring DevOps to statistics, which we're also excited about. And then finally, uh, coming a little bit after that, we're going to be adding support for Conda. Conda is uh, primarily thought of as a Python package manager, um, but it also supports several other languages, and we want to make sure we support everything. So that's the, the main idea. So now all of these package managers will help you work in more languages and have a universal approach to how you develop software. What do you guys think? Pretty cool? I, I, think, they, I think you liked uh, Drawer's demo better, but that's okay. Um, so the other thing that we've been seeing that's kind of an explosion is uh, Kubernetes. And like we mentioned, you know, we're a part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, we've been working with Helm and these other ecosystems. And I want to talk just for a few minutes before we go about Kubernetes uh, registry, the idea of a Kubernetes registry. Okay. So the first thing, um, this is a diagram of a Kubernetes application and the artifacts that make up a containerized application that can be deployed into Kubernetes. So you've got, of course, the Helm chart like we just talked about, which describes how to deploy the Kubernetes YAML. And that points to Docker container images. Inside of those container images is your app. Remember the 0.1% of the code that's sort of your code. And that app has language-specific packages. So you might have NPM packages. You might have Ruby gems or other kinds of packages, depending on what programming language each application is using. And then you might have operating system packages as well. You might be using RPMs or AppGet or uh, Debian. And so these uh, packages also have to be installed in those containers. So when you think about the 
applications dependencies that get packaged inside of it. And this is great because now this app can run side by side because it brought all its own dependencies um, inside the Kubernetes cluster. And by the way, when people think about Kubernetes uh, cluster applications and the artifact storage, they generally think of Docker registry, right? And we've had support for Docker registry in Artifactory for several years. Uh, it's a very popular uh, type of registry that people use with Artifactory along with the other package managers. But one piece of feedback that we got from our users is that because Artifactory's been around since you know, Maven times and pre-Docker, it didn't really have the user experience of an idiomatic Docker developer that they would expect. So I'm happy to share with you um, that in Artifactory we now have what we call the Docker package native UI. Ah. Now, I know all of you just use the command line, so you're never gonna look at this, because you never look at a web page in your life anymore, because you're all programmers. But uh, what's cool about this UI is it's right inside of Artifactory. You click over, you can see your Docker images, you can see layers, you can see tags. It's super searchable. Um, it, we haven't removed the other UI. You can still see in the tree view and see all the packages together. But if you're coming to Artifactory, having played with some of the other Docker registries out there, this is gonna just feel super intuitive. And uh, the idea is also that in the future, we can expand our package native concept to, to reach other communities that have a certain UI idiom that we wanna expose in Artifactory. So I think it's really cool. Now, coming back to that app, okay? The app doesn't just magically appear at the end. We also have a process, a CI CD process, and a way that we construct the application from these pieces that we're sourcing from, uh, from other places and packages. So you can think of it as kind of, you start with your operating system, you add the application-specific and language-specific packages um, that your application depends on, you add your code to it once it's you know, built um, and compiled if necessary, you Docker build that and create a Docker container image, and then you've got the Helm chart. And all of these pieces make up an app that can be deployed to Kubernetes. And like I said before, when we think of Kubernetes apps and the registry that goes with it, we kind of think of Docker. But you're not using just Docker, you're also using Kubernetes. And so it kind of raises this question of like, why aren't we using a Kubernetes registry? To me, what that means is not just about Helm, and it's not just about uh, the Docker images, it's not just about the, it's the other pieces as well. Now, imagine, for example, that you're building, I'm just gonna pick one at random, an Angular app, which is a super popular uh, Node.js uh, web and mobile uh, framework. Well, if you've got Angular, you're gonna have to NPM install the Angular pieces into your Docker image. Now, if you wanted to take that Docker image and all you have is a registry, that means you're gonna have to uh, use that image as your means of transporting that code, or you're gonna have to rely on an external NPM registry. There's this thing called NPM, which knows how to deal with NPM uh, packages, and we support NPM in Artifactory in the same system. So when you're thinking about how do I know which NPM package specifically ended up in my Docker container that ended up in my Kubernetes YAML managed by Helm that eventually ended up in my Kubernetes cluster, you wanna be able to answer that question. And the way that you answer that question, as we said earlier, is with metadata. And that metadata only comes when you track it. So by having all of the different pieces that make up a containerized application that can be deployed in Kubernetes, you need Kubernetes registry. Now this is uh, very familiar probably to Artifactory customers. And how many Artifactory users are there here? No one? Uh, <laughs> let the record show that everyone raised their hand. Um, you already know the value and the power of being able to see what's going on and not have a dependency on an external repository because you're caching your libraries and packages and you're able to build without having to go out to the internet. It's really powerful. And also when you're trying to debug what actually made it into production, these are really important problems you need to solve. So I want you to think about the Kubernetes registry as a role that Artifactory can play for you. I'm not, it's not a new product, it's not something different. It's a different role that Artifactory can play with you on that journey to Kubernetes. And we know, and I think Shalomi mentioned this uh, yesterday, we know that a lot of you are experimenting with Kubernetes. We know that basically all of our customers are exper experimenting with Kubernetes and want to go there. But we also know that the vast majority are not in production yet. I think that's gonna change over the next year. And we really wanna help be a part of the ecosystem uh, and help you get into the ecosystem and to adopt Kubernetes because we really believe in it. In addition to all the other places you wanna run software, but we, we know that this is gaining so much, so much steam. So we've we started to build an ecosystem around this for us where we're saying, 
the Kubernetes clusters in the market that we currently work with as their Kubernetes registry. And the, the icons I've got here are some of our great partners. And we've already uh, announced and released uh, integrations to make it easier so that you can use your uh, artifactory uh, instance and your artifactory system to store the containerized applications that will flow into these. If you go look, there are over 50 ways to run Kubernetes. I used to say 32 when they first announced the Kubernetes uh, certified clusters. I think it was 32 were announced on day one. And the number has just gone up from there. There's a new announcement all the time. I think Rackspace just announced uh, a couple days ago. Um, they chose to announce during Swamp Up, of course, um, the uh, Kubernetes uh, cluster that they're going to offer. And this is, this is just today. And there's great partners that, that we're working with on, on these uh, solutions. And then we're looking to the future, and I'm happy to share um, three that we're focused on for the next iteration. We're working with Nutanix, um, with AWS, and with IBM. And we're going to continue to partner with, uh, with uh, Kubernetes offerings in the market to uh, deliver a really comprehensive artifact management story that's optimized for containers. Now, if you have feedback about what c container or Kubernetes uh, solutions or companies you're working with, we'd love to hear it. Um, we'd like to make sure that we're, we're meeting customers where they're actually deploying software. So um, at the beginning, I kind of talked about the water balloon hitting you in the face. But hopefully together, this is more what it'll look like. Ah. Explosions! No, see, they're not ready. Oh, there it was. All right. Thank you very much. Before I finish, before you applaud, oh, go ahead and apply. That's fine. Good. All right. Good. I just want to say a couple things. I know this is the last keynote of the day. I know you're anxious to get your book signed and go get food and everything else. Um, first of all, thank you to our sponsors. We could not have done this event without you. We couldn't do our business without you. Give a round of applause to our sponsors, please. I, I'm, uh, I'm continually humbled by who will actually answer the phone when I call. Uh, in, the, in the market. These companies that we're working with are just uh, amazing companies, and they, they do so much, um, and they, they love, we love working with all of them. Um, I also want to encourage you to stop by the expo if you haven't. Uh, you know, it's a, a great space to go and talk to people and, and to get connected. It's going to be uh, near where the book signing is happening, so it's, please do that. And then on behalf of JFrog, I just want to thank all of you, every single one of you, for your attention, for your energy, for your insight about the market and what's going on in DevOps. You should all be proud of yourselves, honestly, for what you're doing to change your culture, your company, your technology. It's, it's just amazing. And I want you to give yourselves a round of applause, please. And uh, who else can I thank? I think I'm enjoying the stage too much, Shlomi. All right, thank you so much, everyone.